Welcome to Blockchain Battlefield. Yes. Where we put 100 startups against one another in a battle to the death. The last remaining 10 will come up on stage and present their projects to 10 of the world's greatest VCs and judges. We have an illustrious panel this evening. We have uh, Richard Titus of Andronicus. We have Offer Rodham. Uh, I'll announce him later. We have uh, Samuel Harrison of Blockchain Ventures. The next one. The next one. We have uh, Jin Cao from JD Capital. And of course, Amit Pradhan from Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. And the one and only Katerina Strapagnati from Monday Capital. As well as the most beautiful co-host in the room. Her name is Alicia <laughs> Ferratusco from Starfish Network, Thank you guys. the host of tonight's games. Let the games begin. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so excited you guys are here. A uh, little bit about Starfish. Um, we are a uh, emerging tech focus, co-working space, and incubator based out of San Francisco. And uh, we do a lot of events uh, centered around, uh, focused around bringing the community together. And we decided to put this on to connect leading startups with amazing VCs. And uh, yeah, let's battle it out. So. On. I'm your MC, Ryan Brown, also known as Pirate Bay, that's B-A-E, and our first, our first, thank you, I know, that was an amazing joke, our first contestant is Peppo, Peppo, welcome to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, I'm Jason Golver from Peppo, um, my back to you, let's go this way. All right, so first of all, everything I'm going to show you here today is 100% live. It is real, it is on-chain, and it is in the, in the App Store. So if you have a mobile phone, you don't have to just watch the demo. Download the app, go to the, either the, Google, the Google Play Store or the App Store, download Pepo, and you can use it today using the code SFBW. So we launched Pepo in beta uh, a couple weeks ago at uh, DevCon 5. We had a third of all DevCon 5 participants using Pepo. Here's what they're doing. <laughs> So this morning, I read on Twitter that men in unicorn shirts will cause the apocalypse. Well, you know, I tend to disagree. I think we can work together, and for that, you should now join uh, Abby's workshop on a human collaboration, and definitely tomorrow at 9.25, the top. So Peppo features 30-second video updates from people who are makers, creators, developers in the crypto space. Um, the Hi, app is the I first dApp that feels like an app. Uh, that's the first key thing. So we wanted to create a user experience that people wouldn't even realize that it's 100% on-chain, that it's crypto-powered. The app features very simple onboarding. You log into the app using your Twitter account, and then once you log into the app, you're able to secure your wallet. It's a non-custodial wallet with a six-digit pin that has a smart recovery from a smart contract. So users don't need to write down 12 words. They can optionally, but they don't have to. Uh, then we authorize with your biometrics something called Hi. session keys. <laughs> session keys basically interact with a multi-sig that enable the users to not have to manually sign every transaction. So what can we do with that? Well, we can do microtransactions on layer two Ethereum and then, we, then prove them all back to layer one. So if you see over here, when people are using the app, there's this P button here. It's an inverted kind of P button. Uh, it's an inverted heart. It's a new way of transferring likes. Instead of just pressing a like button, 
you're actually collecting tokens. Every time Anyways, you press the token, you're transferring Friday, one cent from the person who's so pressing the button to the other person. Um, the crypto is used within the app for tokens of appreciation. So you like someone's update, you tap the P button, you can tap as many times as you want. Uh, it's a seamless transactions. There's no manual signing of the transactions. Tokens are also used for signaling, so every time you spend money or, or kind of contribute to one person's content, it signals to other people the content that they should be looking at. We also do, do paid, for, uh, paid for messaging, so people can set how much it costs in order to message them using the tokens in the app. And every single transaction is decentralized, peer-to-peer, on-chain transactions between individuals. The app is the first crypto-powered app as of last week approved by Apple in the App Store. This is a big deal. The app is regulatory compliant, it's FinCEN compliant, uh, it, has, it has purchased the tokens in the app. You can actually use top up in the app with Apple Pay. Um, and then you can even convert your tokens to stable coins by buying unicorns. And then you can cash out your unicorns on the people store for gift cards. So we have both on ramps and off ramps built into the app that are regulatory and FinCEN compliant and Apple compliant. And yes, this is all on blockchain. This is, uh, we have a, we're running a full uh, EVM, Ethereum virtual machine on layer two that we prove the transactions back on layer one. Um, the wallet has all, everything you'd expect in a crypto wallet except we hide a lot of the crypto ugliness or kind of the, the stuff that maybe we, before Pepo wasn't as user friendly, we hide that from the user. But underneath there's everything you'd expect. You can add a second device using QR codes. You have uh, uh, their full kind of uh, smart contract addresses, including recovery from the smart contract, uh, session keys, as I mentioned, for meta transactions. All of this is under the hood, so the user can just have a seamless user experience. The uh, best thing about all this is that we built this on OST technology that we've been developing for four years now. It's a complete developer toolkit to enable any app developer to seamlessly integrate the world's first uh, embeddable wallet SDK into any mainstream app. You just plug in a few lines of co code into any Web 2.0 app. It's like using Stripe for blockchain, and you can build your own Pepo. Um, we have uh, companies that are launching their own Pepos, their own integrations, these microtransactions into their apps. We have a company called BrewDog, for instance, the largest craft beer company in the world. Uh, they are launching in two weeks on Pepo uh, and launching 100,000 customers with the same exact technology. Um, and we're off to an exciting start. We had 25% of all DevCon 5 users uh, use Pepo over the last couple weeks. We're now up to 1,100 beta users. We're formally launching the app now. Um, we have 32,000 peer-to-peer transactions in the app already. This is real, real usage. We are now the number 17 DAP in the world, according to State of the DAPs as of this morning. And it's all based on organic usage uh, by users and thanks to the awesome feedback that we're getting from the users. Uh, we had Decrypt uh, uh, was the first to review the app last week during Dev, excuse me, two weeks ago during DevCon. They wrote, super impressed by this app, the best implementation of blockchain I've seen combined with a cracking UX. And that's what happens when you spend four years focusing on the user experience like we've done. And so I'll leave you just with, uh, please download the app, please try it, and Hi, see how people are using it. It's really amazing. With Eric Berry. Eric? Hello. Thank you. Look for the guy with the bunny ears if you want to chat. Thank you for keeping that within time as well. That was brilliant. So this, this means the judges are going to ask you a few questions, all right? Now, this is your Fortnite hammer to hit it out of the park when they ask you their questions. So we got five minutes, one minute question each. Um, really good pitch. Well done. Um, way to show the product. Um, how much do you care about what you actually showed us versus the underlying part? It seems to me that Pepo is less about that 30-second video platform, right? You know, it's two things. So we spent four years building technology to enable anyone to embed an Ethereum wallet, uh, layer two, into any app. We built a scaling solution to prove this can actually work. Um, and then we designed a gorgeous UX, and everything. we put all that through the, through the wallet SDK. Then about a year ago, or just nine months ago, we started doing research as to various use cases, and we, we interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people in the crypto space, and we hit on something that there was a need for people in the crypto to be able to deliver authentic updates to each other, to kind of go beyond the shouting and the maximalist, kind of the screaming on Twitter, and just to build an app for us, for our community. Um, and we're 100, we're 1,000 percent committed to Pepo right now. We believe this can be the crypto LinkedIn. I mean, we see, some people called it as uh, crypto TikTok. We see ourselves as more 
what LinkedIn was to Facebook is what we're doing to TikTok. We're building something where tokens have value and have meaning inside of the mainstream map for professional purposes. Very quickly before I hand it over, I, it, it sounds to me that what you described is a wonderful reference implementation. I'm, I'm personally not convinced that we need a LinkedIn for the crypto community, but I think what you've done underneath and that ease of use and that plug and play is with, with a gorgeous UI is what takes this entire community forward. And so I would be a lot more excited about that part and would love to talk about the fundamentals and the numbers behind that. So really well done. Thank you. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, you, you've created amazing experience here. No fees, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no gas, uh, easy sign up. Uh, it's a great wallet by itself. I have the same question, actually. Um, it's like if we are back in 2000, if we create, uh, you know, the social network for the web because the web came out. Uh, in a few years from now, we will not, uh, you know, most probably will not even mention crypto or blockchain because it's going to be a default, right? Sure. So where do you see your positioning there, and how do you see this evolving in the future? Look, what we set out to prove here is that you can use tokens, you can use value to improve the user experience, not detract from it. Um, and so we proved that, uh, so far with the app, that the crypto adds value. Crypto is used for content curation, it's used for signaling, it's used for messaging, which is kind of a signal versus noise and countering spam. Um, and we think that there's a myriad of use cases that can be, this can be applied to. Um, we believe that uh, Pepo on its own is a very exciting app that we're going to be really leaning in hard to and building you know, more features and building the user base eventually. So look, we started with crypto sort of like Facebook started with Harvard, right? So we're starting with the crypto community. We're going to get it right there. Then we'll move out to VC and tech and business. And then we'll do other verticals. But we think that there's, this thing can grow to be something that's both a use case of crypto as well as a massive consumer app. At the same time, the tools behind it, anyone can use and build, build on to build their own apps as well. How many here do you use Pebble, by the way? <laughs> so yeah, appreciate that you focus on the UI UX part, which is most of the crypto company nowadays is not focusing on. And um, I do curious, how do you easily to Talk about the token model for your users because most of the um, token model is related to network effect, and then it's very easy to um, like lose money or like the fluctuation will um, influence the UI UX a lot. So, as an end user, how are you going to? Yeah, so we carefully designed the token model inside of Pepo first. End users don't even need to know that it's crypto if they don't want to, right? So for them, it just feels like it's points, but it's points that are on a blockchain. So for people who care about it, they can actually see that, you know, they own their wallets, that no one can ever take the tokens away from them. They can see all the transactions on a blockchain. But if a user is just a novice user, they just see it as, okay, I earned some coins, just like I would in any other game, um, or in, I say, like a social environment. Now, the tokens are fluctuating. The, basically, the conversion rate is based on one Pepple coin is one OST token. The OST token is a traded token that's on various exchanges like Binance. Um, and then what we built in is, so we set the price of one Pepo is about one cent today. And the default transaction size is one cent, so to keep it really microtransactions to start. Users can do arbitrary amounts if they want to send more. So you can do person-to-person -person payments of any amount you want. You can buy any amount of Pepo coins you want to through the App Store. And then we have this function that you can self-stabilize by buying unicorns. So we made it fun that you pay, the way that you basically, let's say you earn like $10, $20, $30 worth of Pepos, if you want to then convert that to stable, you just buy unicorns. And unicorns are always worth $1 each. What and then- buy? What do you buy? Unicorns. Wow. And the reason it's unicorns is because unicorns are cool. No. Um, we also like, so if someone, let's say you're a content creator and you earn, you know, $10 or $20, um, you know, and you, you might say, I want to make sure I hold on to that. I don't want to be susceptible, susceptible to fluctuations. You, you buy unicorns then, and then also so the price change between then and cashing out, let's say, to your gift card or the future to, let's say, to Ethereum or something else, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about the fluctuation. So we built, we, and by doing it with the unicorns, we've made it kind of fun for the users and a way for them to learn that there's volatility and stabilization. We got time for one more question. One more Who quick wants it? Question. Good. So how many downloads and users do you have today? Yeah, so we, we launched the app three weeks ago at DEF CON 5. Uh, we have about 1,300 users. 
Um, now, uh, over 800 of them have participated in the last week. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's growing. The, the number 17 right now on State of the DApps, and the usage is just growing. It's a uh, very active user base. Thousands of videos created, uh, real interaction, 30, what is it, 33,000 transactions done uh, by, over, uh, by just you know, a little more north of 1,000 users. It's very, very heavy volume, volumes right now. Thank you. Thank you. Try the app, please, please. Bitcoin team, and Thank, you. We Thank you very much. You heard it here first. No gas, less bloating, Pepo, just like your uh, girlfriend's Halloween costume, it also looks really sexy. So this is a fantastic project. And up next, we have Creamy Nougat. Welcome, Nougat. Delicious. I didn't get the clicker. Who took the clicker? Does anyone in the room have a clicker? All right, here we go. Hello, everyone. Hi, judges. My name is Rob Banke. I'm the CEO of Nougat. Over at Nougat, we are creating the incentivized open source development network. There's a serious problem right now. 92% of every single application on this planet contains open source components. Um, and that's, you know, nonprofits, for profits, governments. But there's a huge problem. The huge problem is that people do not get paid for contributing to open source. And the things that run the internet get abandoned uh, left and right. So basically, people need to be incentivized on a constant basis to continue to develop with open source. This is why uh, a company like GitHub inspired so many people. They basically created one of the first developer social networks about 10 years ago. Obviously, that's why most people in this room are aware that they were recently acquired by Microsoft for $7.5 billion. And again, the serious problems are that developers don't get paid. There's very few incentives that exist today. Uh, important repos get abandoned. Community management across major open source components are really disorganized. And there's fragmented ecosystems. So this is why we're creating NuGet. At NuGet, we are incentivizing open source development. Now, let's go ahead and show you what this looks like. Why? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take this for now. OK. So you log on to NuGet. Now, over on the right-hand side, you have the projects that you've already uploaded. Uh, let's say you are a maintainer of an open source project. You can go ahead and see who, what features have been funded, uh, how much money you've raised for some different features to be made. And in this instance, if you're a developer, here's a particular task that you'd like to have made. So you can view the source code. From there, you can, as a developer, go on, take a look at it, code it, push it, Submit it into NuGet, and congratulations, you just got done developing for an open source initiative. Now, as a maintainer, the community has already raised $5,000 for this particular feature. So after taking a look at every single code submission, we can go ahead and allow, we see that this woman, Mabel, has the best code, has the most efficient code, and she's gone ahead, and as a maintainer, we are going to pay Mabel for a job well done. For the first time, Mabel just got paid for submitting and committing to open source. Now, because Mabel did a great job, excuse me as I uh, make this work. Uh, let's see here. Awesome, I'm just gonna run it like this. Does that work? No. Play again. If I hit play. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. All right. So now, if she went ahead and Mabel just got done committing to open source, so every single one of these uh, personas are going to get points for doing well in the open source community. Now, I've personally uh, exited an organic food company many years ago and learned about cooperatives. So, Nougat 
essentially we wanted to create an open source cooperative where people are then paid uh, additional USD that either gets sent to themselves or the open source project of their choosing for the points that are well done. Now to be very clear, we are not a blockchain project. We are a centralized web app. Uh, you know, it's the only place I have to say that. Um, you know, the fact is that our point system will be built upon an EOSIO sidechain. Um, and like I said, we're gonna be giving away a certain percent of profits back to the open source community. Now from a market size standpoint, uh, the developer social network side is going to be a $2 billion industry, but we're all familiar with the recent Red Hat acquisition, and basically open source acquisitions just continue to rev up, so we anticipate the market size just to only increase. We have a huge unfair advantage at this point, which is a lot of people in the room today, a huge untapped market of developers who want to be paid as well as incentivized for doing open source commits. We also think that timing's on our side, and if anyone subscribes to the Peter Thiel uh, style of last mover advantage, you know, companies have tried to do something like this before. They've, they, you know, GitHub's been around. We think that there's some huge problems still to be solved. Now, this idea came from our winning team from the EOS San Francisco Hackathon. So we beat out over 100 teams uh, taking home this grand prize here. And the team and project has really evolved from this time. So. Right now, uh, you have myself who uh, started a token agency, has two exits. Our CTO is ex-Google, spent six years at Google. Uh, Thomas Powers, our full stack developer, was at EOS Bet, Fred Madrid, ex-Disney, um, and our wonderful advisors here as well. Revenue stream-wise, we have a couple dozen ways we've actually identified to monetize. The most specific one is transaction fees. Um, premium listings, so to be a top task or a top repo within our ecosystem. And then, of course, a marketplace SaaS mechanism. Um, when you look at all of open source today, it's obviously a very large ecosystem. Um, this is the low-hanging fruit, though. The people who are not as mature as a Fortune 500, but still are incentivized to make money for their open source repos. And we're having conversations with all these companies and many, many more. Um, so why they would want to come in and work with Nougat is they would utilize us for community management, project management, and community voting mechanisms. So at this point today, um, we have, okay, um, we've bootstrapped for the last year, and we specifically wanted to get this platform up live and operational before we raised any money. So this will be up and live uh, at the end of the year. Um, we are currently raising a $2 million seed fund. Uh, our next steps are to do that, as well as heavily focus on business development. The tech is there, the incentives are there, the feedback will be there. It's just a matter of bringing on more and more open source repos in the platform. So everyone that's in the room today, please, we would absolutely love you to come and join Nougat. Um, and you can feel free to sign up at Nougat.io today. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for... So, so it's a five minutes of questions. So, uh, I, one of the funds I'm an advisor to was an early investor in GitHub. So, your biggest challenge is the two sided market aspect. What is your strategy for solving that two sided market problem? Okay, so, so there are many different incentives that do actually today exist in open source, but there's not one central place where those are coming into and sort of exist today. Um, I was recently in Wyoming for uh, uh, that event, and I actually talked to the head of um, the University of Wyoming's computer science division. He saw a massive opportunity for basically university grants to come in um, and just put those uh, actual proper US dollars into an ecosystem like this. So university grants is one of a couple ways. Um, most Fortune 500s dedicate 20% of developers' time to contributing to open source. Those times are real dollars, those are real money that's being deployed there. Um, so these are just a couple of the ways that we see. And I think, I think I would be so bold as to say that our strategic advantage is actually not so much on the technical side, it's on the biz dev side. So we are gonna go out and we're gonna talk to every single Fortune 500 as well as upstart uh, open source repo and, and just continue to refine, refine, refine. Anyone? Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. 
Thanks very much. Um, this question on the market size or the, the TAM, it, it looked like it was two billion with a bigger bubble for 33 billion or something. 10%-ish take rate. Do you think that's sufficient to build a big business? Like even if you get 100% of that and then take 10%, you're not left with a massive uh, revenue opportunity. And then second piece is why did it need to be on chain, on the EOS chain? All right, so the red bubble was for just the sort of development uh, social network side. So that's like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. So that's why the, those bubbles were smallish. And that actually represents the revenue, not the, uh, not the uh, uh, I guess, the valuation size. Um, the bigger was basically the revenues inside of all of open source. Um, so that's sort of the clarification on the TAM. Um, and I, and I think, it, it's my personal opinion that we need to actually do a little bit more research into those bubbles because they seem to be much larger, in my opinion. Um, and then your other question was... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, why, why EOS? So it actually, ha I mean, the idea happened on t uh, at the EOS IO uh, hackathon. And the reason why we're doing that, so first of all, I mean, a lot has changed. Originally, we we're gonna do completely on-chain everything. This is, like, to be perfectly clear, we are a centralized entity. This will not be put on-chain whatsoever. Our point system, however, will be spun up using an EOS IO uh, sidechain. Um, that's just out of preference. Uh, in our opinion, blockchain is a feature of our app. That's, that's the most, so it's not, it's not a core functionality. So the value proposition of this is very similar with Ethereum. Like when, um, yeah, when Vitaly talked about, oh, why Ethereum? Why? Because most of the open source projects, they die because of lack of funding, even though they have really good tech. Um, but the most obvious value add is the financial incentive for the developers. And now we can see your incentive is the community building mechanism, but those ones require you have the volume already. So then it come back to how to build that, like developer resources. Um, so on the financial incentive wise, do you have any specific mechanism like to incentive the developers? Um. Yeah, certainly a great point. Uh, so incentives. That's why we still wanted to have a point system within our ecosystem. Um, it'll be a digital asset that sits on top of you know, our, our side chain. But that being said, um, you know, there are hard dollars that are going into open source. I think a lot of us are familiar with these. Um, the incentives are there, but they're in all these desperate places. So we want to bring them all under one roof. Um, so yeah, so I think that's, I, I mean, I just don't, uh, I, I understand what you're saying regarding Ethereum, but you know, this is, I mean, this is blockchain and this is open source. You know, it's so much bigger than the blockchain ecosystem. And you know, that's the thing, we were, we came out of a blockchain hackathon. However, you know, you're not gonna really see us too much at, at blockchain developer conferences all that much because we're, we're trying to go after the, you know, the larger developer conferences and the larger, you know, like just the entire ecosystem in general. Oh. Yeah, so let's, let's just unpack that bit because I think that's the core of why your business should or should not exist, right? So if you think about your comparison to GitHub, you're creating a monetization, incentivization uh, model around the idea of GitHub. Largely, right? I mean, today you can use GitHub, you can use any of these repositories, and you can contribute to projects, right? But you're not getting compensated. And there's no proper structure for it unless you're part of a team, and that's you're getting compensated on the outside, right? So you're introducing the monetization model for open source developers. Isn't, isn't that the core of what you're trying to do? Uh, I would say that's one part of it. The okay. Other, Right. But there are developers around the world that still want to keep it up. Right. So our platform will allow a developer to shout out loud to the community, I want to build this, who will pay me money to build this, or who will provide me additional developer resources to help me achieve this. 
Right, so the bounties, so to speak, are created by the, by the producers of the project, and you just orchestrate that, or are you setting the value of the bounties for anyone who comes and participates? And the second part to that, to unpack that, is when a commit happens is when you're saying you got funded, as opposed to someone being able to check that that commit was useful and it was valuable and it worked properly and what is the mechanism to manage all that? All right, so uh, there was only so much that I could show within this five minute presentation. QA um, within our system, if you are a code auditor or a code reviewer, you are getting more points and more incentivized than any other persona on our place. We know that that's one of the most single most important parts of this. Um, uh, so, so, so that's that. Also, uh, we as Nougat as the platform do not decide much of anything. We are giving you, like you have a, a, an open source repo, you now are tools. We are like a toolkit or a tool set. You now have the tools to um, state that this particular feature, um, you know, I, I can, you can give money to that feature, I can give money to that feature. So every persona that we had mentioned here can theoretically fund uh, an open source project. Um, so it's really just at all these different places coming in for that. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. <laughs> Biggest question, can we pay to make Fortnite disappear? <laughs> Is that, can, you, can we list that on the show? All right, so Nougat, thank you so much. And of course, what do you want after some delicious nougat? You want some espresso. So our next group, espresso, please come to the stage and wow us with your project. Awesome, coffee on the blockchain. Just kidding. Good, and I'll just snag it. Thank you. Awesome. All right, I'll do a little spin. Uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Remy Carpenito. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Espresso. Our goal is to turn every developer into a blockchain developer. Just a quick background on how we got here. Uh, my co-founder and I have been working together for the last several years. Um, we started another company to replace the student ID card with NFC chips and smartphones back in 2013. Still think it's a great idea. It was a bit ahead of its time. Uh, we ended up pivoting into a mentoring platform and getting students and alumni connected in over 60 schools and up to a million users. And at that scale, we got asked to interface with legacy single sign-on tech. We went back to the roots of the company trying to fix student identity, this time using the blockchain. What we quickly realized is a lot of the infrastructure that existed from the blockchain tech was nowhere near ready to kind of support our application at scale. Uh, so we ended up building out some middleware components that enabled our kind of more junior JavaScript team to participate in that uh, project. And we realized there was actual product there. Uh, and coincidentally enough, we were approached by a competitor in the higher education space to acquire our client base. We met with the board last summer. We sold the client base and spun off Espresso full time. The rest of the team is split between Boston and San Francisco. Everyone has over 10 plus years of experience in the software development world, um, or in the startup world specifically, uh, and have all been part of exits. So why now is a question I get asked quite a bit. Um, well, the development spend in blockchain is going up. Uh, that's, I think, given at this point. Um, but what's really interesting is that you see a lot of the Fortune 500 companies getting a lot of attention, but there's a huge opportunity in the mid-market segment. And as you drill a layer down, what's super, super interesting is that the blockchain engineering demand is outpacing every other engineering hire multiple times over. So where's the disconnect? Well, blockchain development today is obviously way too complex. Um, there's a lot of disparate tools that you have to piece together, um, and that needs to be simplified. And on top of that, the, the uh, demand and the uh, lack of knowledge is clearly creating an imbalance. So the solution is Espresso. Uh, we're a platform for kind of bringing modern applications to market right, through integration of blockchain. Uh, we're a second layer API solution, no code smart contract environment, off-chain data store with hosted wallets and nodes. Um, pretty much we're an end-to-end -end development solution. Um, something you're somewhat familiar with in a lot of the kind of centralized web world today. So why Espresso? Well, if you look at something as simple as deploying a smart contract today, you need to use Chrome extensions, you gotta learn Solidity, you gotta use different Truffle environments, you potentially need to acquire test Ethereum. Uh, 
it's a pretty high hurdle for a non-blockchain developer to jump into. With Espresso, you create an account and you click and deploy through a no-code interface. So we're lowering the learning curve, um, we're I increasing your uh, speed to market, and we're saving a company's time and uh, resources. So we've uh, shipped uh, three products to date. Um, Perkle is our own uh, blockchain. Um, what that is is actually no different than Ethereum. It's a clean fork. Uh, the reason we did that is to expedite our own internal development and start building up community. Um, so all of our APIs and SDKs initially start on Perkle, but immediately speak to Ethereum. The reason we did that was to speed up our development, but also start building up a community around that. The first application we deployed uh, is an API to kind of getting our API some initial engagement is a chatbot on Discord. That's been live for about a year, and we have over 50,000 API calls that's being used on a daily basis since then. Uh, one of the first public-facing tools built using our, with our API and JavaScript SDK is our multi-chain block explorer. Um, that's been live for uh, several months now. Uh, about 800 u active users there and about 4,200 sessions. So where are we and how does this business kind of scale? Uh, well, Espresso is a SaaS platform through and through. We have a meter against the API, so the more of an application scales over time, the more they pay. Uh, we have about 12,000 users in interested in using that product, and we're pushing through a pretty intensive tight feedback loop private beta process. Um, but we're really focusing on the B2B side at the moment, uh, mid-market companies, not the enterprise. Uh, we're talking to a tax company that processes over 50% of U.S. state tax returns today. They want to use our node infrastructure, smart contract management, um, API and off-chain data store to automate uh, the, the reconciliation process from, uh, um, from a month lag time to near real time. We have a donation platform that's a former higher education channel partner. Um, they process over half a billion dollars in donations. Um, they currently use Stripe for a credit card, um, Plaid for ACH, and Espresso for crypto. And uh, said earlier, and kind of echoing this again, is that API businesses grow into absolutely substantial businesses. Twilio and Stripe have done this for their respective industries, and we're going to do this for blockchain. We're in the middle of a round. Uh, we're halfway through our seed. Um, we have a half, half, uh, half a million closed, half a million circled, and we have a growing pipeline of um, clients. And the goal here is to really uh, ramp up our team a little bit more, expedite development, and start building out a deeper pipeline. Um, sneak peek of the upcoming kind of direction we're going aesthetically uh, with the design, which at this point, brand and user experience, as we heard earlier, is a really important factor in what we're doing, and we're going to continue to push that uh, boundary a bit more. Um, so thank you. That's, that's all I had today. Hi, nice to meet you. So what I like is that you target traditional developers, which makes sense. Um, my question is in terms of scalability. Uh, so do you have to uh, connect with all the other blockchains or the developer, blockchain developer has to connect to your uh, protocols API? So how does it work? It's like a marketplace or? Yeah. Um, so we do the kind of reconciliation, the kind of the um, connection on the back end. Uh, so you'd connect to our SDK or API and then you could pick which blockchain you want to deploy uh, to. Uh, at this point, it's, all, it's, it's Ethereum. Um, but we're tracking uh, additional protocols to, to connect to in the future. Um, right now, all of our research shows that the vast majority of developers are on Ethereum. Until that changes, uh, that's, that's the direction we're heading, if that, if that answers your question. Yes, yes. Yeah. So your target market are developers, right? Whether enterprise or individual. Um, so what is the, talk to us about the sales team and the sales channels to get to that market and, and what do you see that size being? And, and maybe list uh, a comparison that you're using to benchmark? Um, yeah, so on the business front, um, you're looking at the sales team at the moment. Uh, we're a small team, we're a team of uh, six split between Boston and San Francisco. Uh, but I built out a somewhat significant sales organization with my last company, Campus Tap. Uh, we were running about four to 500 inbound leads per month, 40 to 50 demos per week. Um, my former head of sales was just in the room. Um, and we, we are going to replicate that here. Um, again, the reason we're going after mid-market is we believe that it's lower hanging fruit. The big companies can pay millions of dollars for consulting. Uh, we're talking to companies like the DTCC and some other prominent names in the industry that don't want to hire consultants to help build. They want to lean on a tool set. So our thought process, if we can enable existing dev teams of these mid-market companies, that's more value to them than a one-off of consulting engagement. So um, it'll be an inside sales team. Uh, we have a pipeline that's growing organically. I haven't spent any money on marketing yet, um, but there's a, this is something we, we can do. Higher education is a notorious slow-moving industry. We went from five to 60 schools in 12 months. Yeah, 
Uh, the reality is at the end of the day, no matter it's a layer one, layer two, or it's a protocol, and they all want to be the interface to developers. So in terms of those competitor-ish, because at the end of the day, it's all about volume and how better, how good the UI, UX, how good the onboarding process, I think everyone is has been very competitive in terms of that. We can see a lot of like public chain, they are using like easier language and like what exactly get easier for developers? Great question. Uh, one at a macro level, I think with any company, no matter if they have infinite dollars, you gotta be focused, especially this stage of the industry. And if a protocol is trying to be everything for every developer, they're not gonna be anything for anyone. Uh, for us, we're really just focused on the developer experience. We don't need to worry about the structure of layer one. We don't need to worry about consensus or governance, all those really complex issues where most of the teams and dev teams and those layer one solutions are focusing their time. Um, I think for us and where we create differentiation is the no-code environment is something that's going to be an on-ramp for novice developers coming into the space. That's something we haven't seen quite yet. I think the off-chain data store, centralized, there's nothing decentralized about it. Not every single piece of data needs to be decentralized. So what we're doing is we're creating channel partners in the higher education and post-secondary education with like General Assembly and giving them access to Espresso so they can deploy their first smart contract or blockchain enabled app for free and then ideally bring that into their businesses. So I think it's, it's a blend between channel strategies and ultimately an experience that we're just focusing on that top layer rather than everything else. Does that answer your question? So you're raising two million bucks. Yep. Uh, what are you going to use it for? Yeah. Great question. Um, <laughs> uh, pretty simple. We're hiring two more developers. Um, I'm going to run sales initially, and then once I get the process uh, defined a bit more, uh, we're going to hire another sales engineer. Um, it's also going to uh, increase our marketing spend, which at the moment zero. Um, so nothing too astronomical. Just going to continue the path we're on, but a little bit faster. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah, I can yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It wasn't clear to me, probably my own lack of understanding, how much of this is consulting, white glove, you go and help them implement versus self-service platform, it's there, you come use it. Yeah, it's a great question. Great question, something we've been thinking a lot of internally. Early clients, we're going to be relatively hands-on. We want to learn what they want. At scale, the way we look at the kind of initial onboarding experience at the enterprise level, from an independent developer, fully self-service, they don't need us. On the business level, it's going to be like a HubSpot model, if you're familiar. Um, when, you sell a, when you buy a HubSpot subscription, yeah, yeah. yeah, you get eight hours of professional services that you have to buy. It's going to be very similar, a little bit more technical. The reason being is that we want to get our infrastructure embedded into their tech stack, and we want to make sure the developers know which features they can kind of latch on to and increase stickiness, ultimately. Cool. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Very much. I'll tell you what the $2 million is for, Richard. It's for launch parties, right? <laughs> why, why else would you raise $2 million? Okay, so we all just had some espresso. So let's get the energy level uh, a little higher in the room. We got a few more of these to go. Let's clap really hard for the next one. I left zero. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. And thank you, judges, for being here. So... Where is my clicker? Right here? All right. Wonderful. Did somebody press play? <sighs> See, I didn't even set this up. They did. I, Hannah, it's all your fault. OK. And then click. Click. All right, perfect. Does it work? Yeah. And then let's, uh, that would be fine. All right, so my name is Matthew Nieberg. I am the CEO of the All of Zero Foundation. We are a crypto foundation based in the Crypto Valley in Zug in Switzerland. And I'm, I'm here to really kind of ask you guys, what do we mean by decentralization? So let's actually have a honest con you know, conversation about what this really means. So if we have 10 mining pools and we just randomly elect one person to be in charge of choosing the transactions to include into a block, is that really decentralized? What if it were 21 people? Is that decentralized? What if this 21 people are just sitting there and they hardly ever get, you know, rotated in and out. What if I were able to tell you that we could do this with 128 nodes and pushing it higher, where everybody has the egalitarian opportunity to be chosen as part of this protocol? So how do we achieve decentralized network without any sacrifices? We want to be scalable. What do I mean by this? 
as soon as we have more people using the platform, more people joining, more dApps on this, uh, you know, using, using our protocol, using this setup, we want to be able to scale, right? So no bottlenecks. We don't want one, one particular dApp that's going to take 10% of the bandwidth of the network. That's just really not a good user experience for people to use these protocols and these networks. We want to offer a feeless solution. So we believe that value transfer, regardless of what type it is, it could be your own underlying token, should be free. And then finally, we want to be able to offer a fully leaderless and trustless environment for people to go ahead and choose the order of the transactions in a way where not a single party is able to go ahead and control the process. And one more thing. We want to do this all on a permissionless public platform, but using private computation of data. So why is this really important? First of all, no enterprise in the world actually wants to go ahead and put public data on a public blockchain. They want to have private data on a public blockchain. So how can you do like machine learning applications, anything like this, but you want to have your data private if you're a company. Okay. But the question is, don't we have all of these things already? Yes and no. Okay. So introducing Aleph Zero. What we've been able to do is identify that the primary concern and problem with most of these protocols and networks is really the inefficiency of the underlying uh, uh, layer one platform. So what do we do? We're peer reviewed. We just got done coming back from Zurich just this last week. We were at the Advances in Financial Technology where we presented our paper. And at this paper, what we were, what we were able to prove with our protocol, constant communication complexity, constant number of rounds in order to, to achieve transaction latency. And as a cherry on top, the first ever asynchronous distributed key generation protocol. First of all, this is a very, very important uh, issue. Asynchronous distributed key generation, you may also know it as a randomness beacon. Okay, same thing. So it turns out that you actually need randomness for a lot of applications to make them really, really secure. Okay, second of all, we want to have private smart contracts. So we want to be able to have these smart contracts that are able to do computations of data in a private you know, function, but on the public chain. We want to have built-in blockchain interoperability. And this can be done using this asynchronous distributed key generation protocol. So we don't want to just be a silo little network on our own. We want to be able to connect to Ethereum. We want to be able to connect to Bitcoin, Cosmos, Tezos, Cardano, all of them. So come talk to us if you want to work together on this. And finally, we are a DAG-based protocol, but we're decentralized. Finally, we have provable security models. At the end of the day, enterprises, governments, nobody actually wants to build on a probabilistic consensus protocol because it really doesn't really have good provable security. So that's one of the things that we spent the last 20 months on, actually proving all the underlying mathematics to be able to do this. So you might ask yourself, well, it's a protocol. What good is it? What's the value generation? Well, it's your standard you know, sort of setup with Ethereum. As you get more people to use the platform and the network, then there's more, there's more demand. And you have a provable mechanism to be able to say, this is the token issuance and the underlying supply. Now, we can all say that, look, we can have a whole bunch of different dApps, a whole bunch of dApps. Everybody's using them. How do we know which ones are really good? So we want to allow for a, a community-voted mechanism to have a store with featured dApps. And finally, it's just a standard model. But what do you do? You just have some type of incubation set up so that you can sort of bring on more developers to build onto your ecosystem and your platform. OK, so scalability without sacrifices. What are sort of, sort of the several key components that we actually need in order to be able to achieve this? Well, we actually need the scalable layer one protocol, which we did. We need to be able to have a place where we can exchange value in a very, very cheap and efficient manner. And so what we're doing is, we're, I'll, I'll introduce this a little bit later on, we have our uh, a decentralized dark pool and a decentralized exchange called Common. 
And finally, we need to have an ecosystem of developers. So not just the applications that we're building, but we want to invite other people to go ahead and build and, and create value. So one fundamental thing to really consider is that without the Al of Zero protocol, there are some products that you just cannot build, OK? This is one of the things that we really want to focus on. So this is why we're doing this decentralized dark pool and a decentralized exchange. So it turns out that there's several different uh, problems that it comes to a decentralized exchange. And you know we can kind of solve this, not kind of solve this, we can solve this in a variety of manners. The first is interoperability. And I, I talked a little bit about this between uh, whenever we want to have interoperability between various platforms. And the real key behind it is to do some type of, yeah, uh, uh, some type of basic um, key generation protocol so that you can interconnect all these other, other, uh, other chains. The second is liquidity. How do we incentivize market makers to provide liquidity to the platform? And we have a solution. And finally, we want to enable privacy. So how can you have a private transactions to occur where you don't have any knowledge regarding the underlying amounts and who your counterparties are? And finally, we need efficiency. So we were able to do this with a, our private testnet in, that's written in Golang. We have 27,000 transactions per second with a 1.7 second validation time. So as far as the general competitive landscape, what we've been able to do is identify what has been done in the best out there and take a lot of those ideas and then combine them into one particular singular product. And so uh, thank you guys for your time. Um, Go ahead and reach out. Feel free to go ahead and contact me via email. Come talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to explain more about the protocol and the platform. And I'll go ahead and take some answers uh, or questions or others from the judges. Thank you. So that's a lot of claims, <laughs> which you ended by saying, and we did that. So can you give us an example of this being used? where you're at right now with this. Um, what would be a great example of why this needs to be there? Thank you, that's a uh, wonderful question. So the first thing you ha really have to consider is, at the end of the day, we really wanna be able to have a, a really fair and efficient protocol. If all these other protocols that exist aren't as efficient as what we're able to offer, then we should be able to have a competitive landscape in order to be able, you know, or even cooperative landscape so that we offer people that opportunity to use what we're building. So we do have code right now. It's up and available on GitHub. It's our proof of concept that we wrote in Python. Now, Python, as we all know, is not a very optimized code base. Can't do parallelization, all sorts of other fun things, right? So what we were able to do is achieve 91,000 transactions per second with a 20-second validation time. You can go ahead and independently verify all of our claims. If I understand well, so uh, in first place, you don't have an order book, right, to the exchange. It's like similar to the compound model. It's more like a generalized uniform. Yeah. Um, so why did you choose this model? Is it, uh, does it make it more efficient? Does it make it better for larger, uh, you know, trades? And the second question is, I saw, for example, one user case is, um, uh, that you have here is the dark pools. But dark pools are not really, you know, uh, we don't really see uh, darkness right now. It's, it's not even a market in the crypto. And it's mainly for more efficient, bigger markets, billions of, right? So why do you think dark pool is a use case? Yeah, so we do think that, for the most part, you're correct. The crypto market isn't as big as the general institutional market for dark pools. However, there is a large market for institutional trading. So as soon as we go ahead and move all of these stocks, bonds, everything actually goes ahead and gets onto a blockchain, onto a platform, we can offer a solution for these people to go ahead and, and use this, uh, this protocol. And uh, could you remind me? No order book, so why? Yeah, no, no order book. Uh, this, is, this enables a little bit, um, some better uh, knowledge regarding the, the no slippage as well as, or little slippage, as well as uh, enabling a better um, mechanism for privacy. What tech are you using for privacy? Yeah, primarily a secure multi-party computation. 
So most of these secure multi-party uh, computation protocols require a secure source of randomness. And because we were able to prove that we have a secure source of randomness, we can go ahead and build products that make use of this. So the current MPC is not a smart contract compatible yet. Is, is that already up and running? No, so we're going to be building out our own toolkit and library for uh, MPC. Or partner potentially with like other people like Enigma or anybody else like Oasis Labs and, and make use of their technology and, and work together on these types of uh, situations. Thanks. You've, you've taken on quite a lot here. How big is the team and how much have you raised so far? Yeah, so we have about 17 people, um, 13 full-time equivalent. We've raised approximately 2 million currently and are just going the standard private sale route for our token. Who is your perfect user of the Alif blockchain? We're really trying to go after developers, right? So we would need to have developers to build their own platforms, bring their community onto our ecosystem, and go from there. Thank you, LF Zero. Thank you very much. All right, and our last contestant for this round of judges is uh, Snowball Money. And I'm pretty sure it's a giant ball of money that just keeps getting bigger and bigger as you roll it down the street. So I'm very excited for this presentation. Snowball Money, please come up. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hello everyone, so we aspire to do things different. How can we become the storm of Jupiter? That's a question I ask our marketing team because if you look at Jupiter as a planet, you've got all these bands of different clouds, but you've got one big red dot, which is the focal point. So I'm gonna ask everyone to change your psychology just by standing up for a quick second. My doctor says sitting is the new smoking, so. I know we've been sitting for some time. Uh, who here has invested in cryptocurrencies or in blockchain? Raise your hand, say aye. aye. Okay, who here has lost money investing in blockchain? Raise your hand, say aye. Okay, you can go ahead and sit down. Please don't hit your neighbor. So some call us the Charles Schwab for crypto. Others call us the wealth front for crypto. But I would like to call us a wealth generation platform which is introducing the masses to this new asset class of digital assets, starting with cryptocurrencies. So what is the problem? Warren Buffett made a $1 million bet that the S&P 500 index would outperform a portfolio of hedge funds. And not only did it over 10 years time, but it did by 322%. Now, as an entrepreneur, when you're starting your journey, you have two different routes you're gonna go. Number one, are you creating new real estate in someone's mind? Or number two, are you hijacking existing real estate? What is their buying activities? How are they transacting? Well, the closest asset class to digital assets is stocks. Approximately 41% of the US is investing in stocks. And who knows how they're investing? Raise your hand if you have an idea, the majority of them. OK, just one or two of you. Majority are, are investing through mutual funds or 401k, which effectively is you have a professional. What's a professional? someone who's licensed, someone who's regulated, they create a portfolio for you. They create a portfolio based on your risk appetite. Now, when you set this portfolio up, you're not investing to become an overnight millionaire, you're investing for the long term. And so, this portfolio is typically tax optimized. If it's a 401k, it's tax deferred. If you're using a platform, a robo-advisory platform like Wealthfront or Betterment, you have tax loss harvesting. And you're making interest whether the market is up or the market is down because your portfolio will either have some bonds or some sort of dividend paying stocks in them. And so Snowball takes this whole user experience and brings it to the masses. And so let's talk about the team really quickly. Um, I also write for Forbes. My co-author is the chief digital officer of Forbes and we are writing about how to make products go viral or find product market love. Um, my background is marketing. Uh, in sales, I took a company, Engineer.ai, that got their first round of funding of 30 million, backed by SoftBank, um, to $60 million of revenue in two and a half years bootstrapped. My co-founder, Michael, who's here somewhere, um, 
he, is, he has a long history in finance, 20 years in finance. There he is, right over here. Everyone give it up to Michael, taking on compliance in a great in industry. And so his background is in finance, has many different licenses, was a hedge fund manager between Wall Street and the CBOE. Our newest CTO is also an investor. Joshua sold his first company at the age of 21 as an AI developer and the CEO of the company. So we're really, really uh, proud to bring him on. Um, and our CMO, who's also an investor, is a celebrity on Instagram getting uh, 3,000 to 15,000 new followers a day and giving us a minimum of 100 impressions per post at no cost, well over 5 million followers on one Instagram. Um, and he has more followers than Gary Vee on all of his Instagram. So, that's our background, and we're backed by some of the best, co-founder of Twitch, former CEO of Salesforce.com, CEO of GetAround, and actually we just had um, the former chief legal officer of Ripple invest in us as well, amongst other legends. And so let's talk about the product. Our product is literally grandmother tested. It's so easy to use. Our goal was, as people come into this asset class of cryptocurrencies or digital assets, we wanted to make it as simple and easy as safe for them to do it. And so investing in a portfolio of cryptocurrencies is as simple as downloading the app, choosing a portfolio, choosing, connecting a bank account, and then watching your portfolio snowball. And so our vision is that as this world continues to get tokenized, you will have venture capital funds which are tokenized, like some of the VCs that are up here. Um, you will have real estate that is tokenized. You'll have sports teams that are tokenized, such that you could have fractional ownership of your favorite sports team. And Snowball's vision is to be the first platform to add all of these asset classes. As a matter of fact, we have two LOIs with uh, tokenized venture capital funds that will be added to our platform um, sometime early next year. And so, okay, cool, Parul, you've got an awesome platform, great design. It's easy to invest in a portfolio of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. But the only thing that matters is economics and user acquisition. Former CEO, Wealthfront. So let's talk about our growth. Um, we were in private beta. Uh, we got, today we have 135,000 people on our global wait list with an iOS app in 36 states in the US. Um, we had about 35,000 people on that wait list, which 50% of those were Android users. And out of 36 states, we had about 6,000 of those people convert into users. So we have very strong brand integrity. And we're assuming an explosion of growth as we go global. And the business model is quite lucrative as well. So our average investor on our platform is investing just under $1,000. 71% of them set up automatic monthly recurring investments. And so uh, as we grow our user base, our AUM grows as well, and it's fairly predictable. And so you know, our, our forecast is we're on track to hit $15 million of assets under, managed with, assets under management with almost no spend in marketing by the end of the year. Um, and we forecasted $1 million by July of next year. And so the road to compliance is, is what's going to give us our one of the moats. This area is is very difficult to enter in. Today, we are a registered investment advisor, and we're regulated by the SEC. Um, the co-founder is a compliance officer, and we have three sets of attorneys, and that is absolutely imperative. My personal thesis is that one should be able to make international remittances without a middleman. But my thesis is also that if you are handling someone else's money, you should be held accountable, and we are by regulators. And so, who are the competition? Today, if you want to invest in a portfolio of cryptocurrencies, there's a few players that are doing that, but no one is allowing you to invest in risk-adjusted portfolios. So we will be launching risk-adjusted portfolios in the coming month, which allows you to invest in a portfolio of cryptocurrencies uh, that it has a mix of stable assets that are generating interest. And so, the success of many companies in this space has been a factor of the current price of Bitcoin. But for us, we will hit our viral coefficient, not only by architecting users joining our platform, we're growing month over month, but also by making people money. And we're able to do that irrespective to the price of Bitcoin, depending on your risk appetite and the portfolio you choose. So uh, the ask, everyone, take your phone out, go to the iOS app store and download Snowball Money. Make sure the app you're downloading looks like the logo on my shirt. Number two, um, distribution partners. So we've got a few distribution partners. Um, Monochrome app, they have over 436,000 users. We have distribution partner with Gem. Um, we have a soft commit with uh, a couple of iBanks as well as uh, an IRA. And so if you have access to distribution partners and you could connect it with us, 
that's very interesting to us. If you're connected with celebrities or people who are influencers, that's also interesting to us. And if you can help us with either of those things, then we're interested in talking to you about capital. Now that number down there that says we've closed $1.1 million is a lie, because we've closed $2.1 million because we just got a, a deal that we closed. So we've got about $900,000 of allocation left. If you're interested in speaking to us, we're gonna be closing around in the next 30 to 45 days. You can find me right there, p at snowball.money. Thanks everybody. Great pictures always. Everyone should download the Snowball app. Um, what, what is your... <laughs> I think I saw 4,000 and something registered users. What is the conversion from registered to funded? And what is the tension of a funded account, 30 or 90 day or whatever one you prefer? Sure. I'll speak loudly. Um, so we have about a 23% conversion rate of people who download the app to funding their account and 71% of those people set up monthly recurring investments. Um, in terms of our churn rate, it has been about 19%. However, it is 19% because we went from our private beta, which was in all 50 states, and excluded 14 states and had to cash out a number of people. And so it's likely going to be less than that. Um, we launched our app in July 17th of this year, and so that's the data for the last three months. Two-part question, average AUM and average IRR. Yeah, so the average assets under management per user is around $966. Um, we're forecasting that you know, today all the portfolios that users are investing in are purely cryptocurrencies, so if the price goes up, they're strongly correlated. If the price goes down, it's strongly correlated. So estimating what the gains are gonna be is a bit difficult. However, with our risk-adjusted portfolios, if you're in investing in just an interest account, uh, you're likely to make between five and 10% a year, compounding and paid on a weekly basis. And based on your risk appetite, you will have this stable asset, which is generating five to 10% interest with a, up to 10% you know, asset allocation to Bitcoin or a crypto index. So it really depends on your forecast of how you think the market is going to do. Um, if I was to tell you what the price of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is going to be, I would ask you to ask me what else I'm lying about, because I have no idea. <laughs> so do you see Coinbase as a competitor? Uh, you, have, you know, they have the user base, they have the top 10, right? Uh, suggested coins to invest. Uh, they have indexes, so how do you compare with? How do we compare to Coinbase? Coinbase. Well, there's a company called Betterment. It's a robo-advisory company. Betterment won the robo-advisory game, the same as Wealthfront, because they are a fiduciary. It is their legal responsibility to do what's best for the users. Now, Coinbase is a broker-dealer, just like Robinhood, just like the rest of the exchanges or their unregulated exchanges. And they are going to do what's best for themselves. By law, we are uh, mandatory have to do what's best for the user, and that is why we're different, and that is why we're going to win. So what is the most relentless marketing strategy you can think of, but you haven't done, and as a marketing background for consumer um, onboarding? That is a wonderful question. So if you want the answer to that, you're going to have to find me on Instagram, on social media, on LinkedIn, and read my series that I'm writing on how to make products go viral. Number one. Um, number two, in terms of doing that, the virus has to be in the DNA. And so most startups, what they do is, there's three types of customers. There's your owned, your earned, and your purchased. They usually go to purchase where they start spending money to acquire users. But really what happens is they create sparks. So start with your own, your friends and family, your earliest adopters. Get in front of them, shake their hands, ask them questions. Then after you get your first 100 users, Go to your earn. That's the referrals that are coming. Those are the people who need internal validation. That's your first 1,000 users. By that time, you have an idea of who your customer is. Your fire is burning. And you can put gas into the fire by doing additional marketing uh, activities. So that's a, a hint of one of the pieces of the recipe. You've certainly got your uh, 
marketing shoes on, I'll, I'll say that. Um, fantastic. Um, have you thought about uh, an enterprise play as well? Is there, a, is there a snowball API for, you know, companies that are managing a treasury function and shouldn't be because they have a whole bunch of token allocations throughout this whole ecosystem? Absolutely. Uh, distribution partnerships are extremely important for our virality and success. And we actually are finishing our API right now and have already signed a partnership with uh, two applications to be able to create those distribution partnerships. We're talking to several iBanks, which we've gotten a handful of no's. We've been invested in by one, and our CTO was working with one as well. So uh, we, ha we believe that there's a strong, strong opportunity for us to have those closed by the end of the year. And we are looking for more iBanks to white label our product, use our API, and actually create a, a grandmother tested, beautiful user experience, which is up for an Apple Design Award. And if you want to experience yourself, just go to the App Store. Snowball money. Thanks, everybody. Um, hi, I'm Danny. This is Aleph B. So, this is my best friend, Yaeli. Yaeli's a bit of a math magician. She's a senior engineer at Sentinel One. It's a cybersecurity company. And she's a major nerd. What kind of a nerd? The nerd that goes on their maternity leave uh, to a Jimmy Song conference to study programming Bitcoin and during her maternity leave actually uh, starts crypto trading and creating models and algorithms. But Yaeli, although she probably outperformed most of you guys, something. Okay, yeah, yeah, Ellie's an untapped potential in the crypto market uh, because she's never gonna leave her job. It's a pre-IPO company and they keep throwing money down her throat every time she updates her LinkedIn account. Um, she has a mortgage and kids and it, she just likes to do it on the side. But in terms of uh, trader talent, she's untapped potential. Help. This is, uh, this is my dad. My dad's a wealth manager for rich Jews in Florida who play golf all day and have a very low risk tolerance. Um, but apparently a lot of their uh, the second and third generation, their, their grandchildren are trying to push them to invest into digital assets. But my dad as their fund manager doesn't have any investment vehicle that could actually allow for the risk point that, um, the, that, his, firm, that his firm allows in order to invest in crypto. So I bet the judges here and maybe other fund managers have a, a, a whole list of L, potential LPs that this is of interest to and are in the same situation. So the question is, if I only get this to work. So the question is, can we create, oh, the, the one before, that's okay, thanks. Can we create a risk mitigation platform for the volatile crypto market that could actually allow uh, my father and his risk tolerance to participate and have their, ha and have their wealth managed there? So this is what we do. Thanks. Be one. So th yeah, this is what we do. So Alphabet allows traditional investors to invest into crypto assets at a lower risk point. How do we do that? Secret sauce, by tapping it, distributed talent into an aggregated portfolio of diversified strategies. So what this means is how do we do our de-risking model? Our de-risking model means that if you have a lot of, div uh, if you have diversified strategies, um, they balance each other out. So if we have 100 tr traders, those 100 traders have different assumptions, different uh, risk models. They come from different places with different assumptions, with, with different backgrounds. And um, by combining all those, tra all those traders into an aggregated portfolio, we actually get a smoother equity f uh, curve with lower drawdowns. So. And how do, we, how do we attempt to outperform the market? 
Well, uh, our assumption is that the funnel continuously optimizes for the top 5% of traders that we bring into the system, and that's how it keeps on optimizing and actually performs better than the market. Um, in our proof of concept, we had six months we had six months of paper trading with 200 traders and thousands of trades. And what we uh, confirmed here is that, as basically confirmed our thesis and our expectation, that when you have an aggregated portfolio, it displays lower risk and still achieves excellent gains. So again, in an unoptimized um, uh, portfolio, we had lower risk and better returns. But more importantly, it was actually stable and reliable performance over time, even when the market changed. So we didn't reinvent the wheel here. This exists in traditional markets. Um, there's Millennial with the, almost 40 billion under management and 2,800 traders. Uh, uh, WorldQuant, Quantopian, that has uh, over 200,000 members as an algo trading platform. Uh, we're just the first ones to do it in crypto. So, how does it work? Um, our ta talent funnel begins with recruiting new traders, currently 500 in the, fu in the funnel. We have three months of paper trading. The top 5% uh, goes into live trading, and then the top uh, performers who are doing live trading get additional allocations. Then we uh, optimize, monitor, repeat. Oh. Who, are, who are these traders? Awesome. So we have, four, we have four groups. We have four groups of traders. Uh, Protos is an example of an algo trading firm that just wants to check itself against other risk models. So they, they join even though they have millions under their own management. We have algo traders that are um, already, already doing this as day traders but want to but w want to have more funds under management. We have part-time traders that are usually in tech or traders in traditional markets um, that do this on the side. And most importantly, we have distributed talent of uh, uh, traders who basically don't have access to funds. They could be from the wrong country, went to the wrong school, they don't have access to opportunity, but they're very talented, stardust, and we are able to actually give them the ability to be full-time traders. Oh, this is example is Jose from um, Mexico City who went, he's been trading for years, shares all his trades on Twitter, has a nice following, uh, joined our system and is doing really well, over 30% profit in 14 weeks of live trading. Oh, maybe I'll just stand there. Okay. So what's their incentive? We have a regressive rev share model uh, up to 35%. Um, what's unique about this is that once they start accumulating, then 50% of their revenue stays in their portfolio to have incentive alignment and for them to have skin in the game. This changes according to how much money they're managing. All right, we have to wrap it up. Anything okay. you wanna share real quick? Um, then uh, the, the next thing, that we could, we could talk about later is that we have proprietary tech, both for the uh, paper trading platform and for the real life that gives alert and risk management. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. So now we'll answer a few questions from the judges. So who has the first question? So really quick, the incentives are a, a rev share. There's no token or anything, it's just straight cash share of the, the dynamic, okay. Um, for the uh, investor in your platform, is it like uh, eToro sort of, or you do all the statistics and you kind of give, you know? Yeah, so we do, we do all the statistics, everything is, we have a proprietary system of how the fund is done, take the top 5%, we do all, we do all of that. We do the risk management. We do the continued risk management as well, so they're under very strict risk uh, guidelines and uh, the, they're trading, they trade on a sub, they trade on a sub account that's connected to API to our proprietary system that gives us analytics, alerts in real time and we can make adjustments in real time to their trade. Yeah. Um, and, um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> 
right, right, right. So my, my yeah, my, my experience. Some, some, my, my experience with, for example, eToro uh, was that um, uh, traders, you know, they perform uh, really well, but after a while they stop performing and, and they could have, you know, a really bad year. And, and so I'm wondering, how do you keep on filtering that? Do you keep, keep on removing them? And, you know, they're not necessarily bad. The, the way the model works is that we don't necessarily first remove them, but we can lo we can lower their uh, their funds that un is under their specific management to lower the risk point. Uh, and yes, we can also kick them out of the platform in gen in general and always optimize. Always good to kick users out. Hi, Danny. Um, so my question is more around um, back office. So one of the most complex parts of running a fund is uh, regulatory status. So are these funds registered? And then how do you deal with legal back office providing investors with K-1s of aggregated strategy? Is there an administrative fee? Who gets that? Um, I'd be curious to hear a bit more about that because I run an actively traded fund and it's, uh, there are a lot of rules. <laughs> so I'd love to hear more about how you manage that. So I wish uh, the founders were here. Unfortunately, they couldn't come from Israel because they're closing their lead uh, today, which is 400 and, uh, a group of 450 family offices and angel investors who want to back this. Um, so most of these questions would have to be answered by them. They've been running hedge funds and similar platforms in the traditional markets for over 30 years. They're gray hair entrepreneurs. Um, we are accompanied by the largest uh, firm in Israel, Meitar, that does all the regulatory for all the fintech and all the hedge funds in Israel. Um, but more information, I can definitely get you in touch with them. Great. Is there a last question? Yes. Not last question. Okay. I have multi multiple questions. Uh, do you support Tether? Will, will you? I see. So, so in terms of like geography on the trader side or on the investor side, you're saying that you don't actually is you are at, you don't control at all. No, uh, no offshore companies, um, obviously. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, when exactly are you launching? And, and um, so uh, the, the more money we have under management, the more likely they should have. I see. Uh, final question. Yes. For every hundred million in trading volume, what will be to your revenue, your cut? For our, our what? Your the revenue. Volume? For every hundred million in trading volume, how, like how we should think about your revenue. From, uh, anywhere from 20 to, sorry, so the rev, sh the rev share model is anywhere from 20 to 35 percent for the traders. All right, big round of applause for Aleph Bits. And if you have retirees in Florida, you know where to go. All right, our next team up is saldo.mx. Welcome to the stage. See if it works. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, judges, thanks for your time. Uh, my name is Marco. I'm the co-founder of Saldo.mx, a company that uh, I started myself. And uh, because I couldn't accept the fact that there's many people in the United States that still don't have a reliable bank account. 
And for me, a crypto account, it's exactly that. It's, it's, it's somewhere that, that you, your assets can sit on and you actually feel control over them. So for me, this, this product is, is targeting underbanked and I wanna explain for, for ourselves what is our, this underbanked community. I wanna like, describe a little bit uh, of how we figure uh, these, these people are using their money in the United States. It's like, we started this company with the idea of facilitating cross-border payments so that uh, a migrant worker can, instead of sending over money, they can just pay utility bills to support like a family member. So instead of sending like $200, they can like pay the utility bill of, of, of his mom or, or, or another family member. And then we realized that uh, people started using prepaid cards that they purchased at the Walgreens and also borrowing a card from a family member. So basically, they, this community has access to banks, to open bank accounts in the United States, but they don't feel comfort, comfortable with storing their value there uh, because sometimes they have fears of deportation and sometimes they don't even understand the language and, and the fee structure and how overdraft fees work. So the problem right here is there's a gap how to store electronic money that we discover by uh, starting offering this service. And so the next step that we found is a very interesting opportunity. It's how we can add this feature that it's enabling these users to hold a balance in whatever asset they feel comfortable with, dollars, pesos, and still have the connection to the real financial system and have, having the ability to pay these utility bills and sending money to a bank account in a different country. Um, to build a bank, a cross-border bank with multiple currencies, it was an impossible task before crypto. One of the things that we have discovered, it's something like Tether has been showing us how easy it is right, right now to have interoperable electronic money. Before Tether, it was impossible to move money from a PayPal account to an Alipay. And now it's, a, it's very easy for many companies around the world to move money and settle uh, payments using this asset, which is pegged to a dollar. It's, it's, there's a lot of uh, demonstration of how this is useful. There's uh, a lot of volume, even more than Bitcoin sometimes in a 24 hour uh, volume. And back again, what we do is we're not a better Western Union, we're not transfer wise. They are just trying to connect an account A and an account B in different countries. We are trying to be the account. We're trying to build a reliable bank where people feel control over their assets. And the missing part is there, there, there was no peso. It was like uh, a fiat back uh, peso that we could leverage. So we decided to be, build that ourselves. So we are, we established this company, it's a, the model is a fiat based stable, as a stable as a peso can be token, that um, facilitates this, these payments and has the ability to open an API for other assets, for other apps to build on top of, of our system. So our business model right now is making money with merchant fees, like collect, collecting uh, some fee when, when we like collect the utility bill payments. But in the future, we'll be uh, having this reserve uh, and, and, and we keep the interest. We see ourselves as this layer of fiat tokens in LATAM where we know the regulation, how to make it work. Um, our experience has been in payments. I worked myself for a teleco company when we uh, initiated operations for mobile money in Peru, in Guatemala, in Mexico, uh, we set up a clearing house down there. So we've been talking to the central bank about like how make this work in a compliant manner. We're six people. Uh, we have been moving money using these partners over there. Uh, our first version of the of the fiat token works on on Stellar, and right now we're raising money. We're raising 1.5 million, out of which a third has been already committed, and. We are looking for partners who, as well as ourselves, doesn't, like, don't feel comfortable with the idea of having a huge community, millions of people in the US, without a reliable way to hold their assets. So thank you so much. 
and happy to answer any question. All right, thank you. Questions from the judges. Yes, Brayton. Hey, Marco. Can you explain why Stellar? So um, the thing is, uh, the, for the model that we feel comfortable with, it's working with uh, re regulators rather than being very, like, we're a little bit risk averse. Uh, in, in Stellar, over the last few years, uh, there's a layer on top of, of the network which manages all the KYC information that we require. Uh, we don't see that layer actually being built on other ledgers that we consider that are, that are useful. And uh, actually, there are, there are other like many transmitters that we saw were exploring the idea of using Stellar. Uh, we, we, we've tried many others ourselves, but I, I, I would consider that this is something about coordinating players in the ecosystem uh, and also like share practices, especially for the regulatory matters, because this is not re reinventing like the wheel. We're, in, we're not in the algorithmic stable coins. This is a fiat back uh, compliant token. And for us, uh, that works well. We're not saying Stellar is winning, uh, but right now it's good enough. Um, so I understand how you're a fiat back token but the word bank has a lot of other implications. Can you explain the banking component? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I know that bank is like loan origination, stuff like that. Uh, I think for us, it's like how we build the, the first layer and, and the first building block. Uh, because like, I mean, we see this tool as, as just a, the starting point for a community to start building credit and stuff like that. And that eventually becomes a bank. We cannot ourselves provide those services right now, and we don't do. We don't like originate loans for sure. Uh, we don't pay interests. So yeah, it's you're right. I I I I should be more clear, but for us, it's like, it's like a payments bank. Uh, have you, well, you obviously launched on iOS and Android on your on your site. Can you tell us when did you launch? Uh, what's the install base per platform and also active users? Yeah, the active users um, are a little bit, a little bit around above the, the, thir uh, the third of the user total base, which is 20,000 users. Uh, we, we launched initially a version of the app um, as, as a prototype years ago. Actually, uh, we've been like releasing several versions. In, in, in first, it was the only crypto um, version, but as, as it is now, it's been a couple of years where we can allow people paying the bills and also hold a balance, which is the ultimate uh, version that we, that we want to pursue. Um, the last year, it was 300% the growth of the user base, and um, that's, that's what typically they do. They, they, they make uh, $15 average payments, so it's, it's the tiny transactions that they use it for and they actually don't hold a lot of balance right now. So uh, it's like the average is less than $100, but uh, some of them start having two to $250. Um, <clears throat> can you talk through on and off ramps on each side of the transaction and also custody in the app? Yeah, so the way we started is, again, we're doing a little bit of regulatory arbitrage. So we see these being a regulated uh, money issuer based in Mexico that has access to people even without being in Mexico. So that's like the model. And we started being fully connected there. So we're able to process like international cards using an acquiring bank in Mexico. That's one on-ramp. And the other, it's through partners. So, um, so we have a, a payment processor it's a regulated uh, money transmitter in the US, and they just like send us on a daily basis all the aggregated amounts that they collect. And then the off -ramp. So the off ramp, it's, uh, so we, we're fully connected real time with the interbank payment system in Mexico. So we, we, we enable cash in and cash out real time with any bank account. Didn't you say that, that you don't have a bank account? Doesn't a bank hold the cards? 
Um, well, we say that uh, the majority of the users that we have actually have a bank account, sure. but it, it, it doesn't like fulfill all, all, all the needs that they have. Um, but to make this work and, and how the, the custody of the funds work, it's a business that in Mexico has fully access on and off ramps uh, that not necessarily are used directly by the users, uh, that they use their card uh, to top up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, who knew the next stable coin would be the peso? Okay. <laughs> so, our next company, Foundation Key. Please come up to the stage. Here I am. Here you are. <laughs> so, here is the clicker. Let's test it. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Reda. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Key Foundation. Um, I think that we can all agree on the fact that the state of the internet looks like messed. Everything is centralized. Um, even if a lot of the companies in the Web3 ecosystem are trying to tackle some of these issues by solving some of those components like storage, bandwidth, computing, power, etc., etc., the problem is they all, they do not have uh, a homogeneous operating system and a really decentralized infrastructure to run on top of. And this is exactly what we do uh, at the Key Foundation. We are deploying um, an operating system called KeyOS, which enables any hardware device to be an infrastructure node of a really decentralized mesh network. Basically, applications that run on top of the key OS are able to use the idle resources of those hardware devices for computing, storage, bandwidth. The key OS is a multi-adaptative and multi-level operating system um, with a software-defined network component that enables to value any resources that is used by those applications and also to pay out the owner of the hardware with the resources that are being used. Now, how do we get to the point where we will have billions of devices run, running the key OS or the SDN of the key OS? Uh, just to give you a bit of context, so I'm a serial tech entrepreneur. Uh, I have sold um, uh, my previous company to one of the largest hotel group in the world. And I know a lot about the idle resources in the hospitality industry. Um, so our phase one of deployment is happening in that field. We are installing the OS in smart TVs, smart devices in the hotel rooms that actually offer great services for the hotels. I'm gonna come to this. The phase two is leveraging B2B infrastructure like smart routers, idle resources of data centers. And we're talking here about 50 million plus uh, units to be installed. And the last one is obviously consumer hardware. And here we're talking about billions of devices around the world. So how does it look like for the hotels? Um, basically, the key OS is an operating system with an app store, which is permissionless. So any application is, can run uh, on that OS. And those applications go to from like uh, room service uh, in a better way, uh, uh, selling like tour guides, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in addition to the hardware lease that is done by the key OS, each unit that is equipped by this operating system generates between $300 and $500 of additional revenue for the hotels per unit. Uh, so this is amazing. Um, and there is a transaction fee that is happening for each transaction of 15% that is shared, actually used to buy back key tokens on the market and share it with the actors of the ecosystem. One third goes to the hardware owner one third goes to the customers, the cash back in key tokens, and one third goes to the validators of the network that secure the network, who are actually key token holders. And our commitment to decentralization is very strong. So the key foundation is a foundation that holds 100% of operating company. So even myself, as a founder, I don't have any equity. I only hold key tokens. 
So basically, the only way to get a cut of the value of the ecosystem is to buy key tokens. So where we're at today, um, we raised $2.5 million. Um, we are deploying more than 5,300 units with the, the operating system. And we have a pipeline of 100,000 units to be deployed with our initial customers. Um, so we're here because we are looking for more people. We already signed deals with companies such as Noddle. We have also storage building on top of our devices and infrastructure. So basically, if you are one of those companies that are trying to solve the centralization of the web, we are the infrastructure that is going to run the decentralized web of the future. So please feel free to contact me. We will provide you with some of our technologies. And uh, we also are looking for investors that are going want to join uh, the future of the decentralized web. Thank you very much. All right, judges' questions. All right, he used my favorite two words, which are mesh and networking. Um, so where does the demand for the computational capacity in the network come from? And then what is the consensus algorithm that's incentivizing relay between the nodes in the network? Two very good questions. Actually, uh, so I'm going to answer to the first one. We are not the ones that are looking for customers for decentralized computing or storage. You're creating a marketplace. Uh, we're not creating a marketplace. Actually, we build a platform for those applications to have the decentralized infrastructure to find their customers. So for example, iExec, I don't know if you know them. So they do fog computing. They find their customers, and they just leverage our infrastructure to do it. Um, so our job is to find the apps that are going to build on top of our platform, and they're going to leverage this infra. So they find the customers for the fog computing, and they just have to pay in key tokens the owners of the hardware. The second question, and it was actually a very good question, um, we have a novel consensus protocol called proof of reputation that actually enables to have an unlimited set of validators so that there is actually a fair way of distributing value in the network. Um, so basically, it's uh, a mix between DPoS and PBFT. Um, you can have actually uh, an unlimited uh, validators waiting to, to become validators and to get a chunk of those transaction fees that are coming from real life business value. This is not us. It's, for example, storage. Um, so the client is running on our devices, and they do the whole job of leveraging that network. So our software-defined network is just locally on each device. And those apps, such as storage, SIA, Noddle, or else, they are the one that take the heavy burden of de dealing with that. We actually are doing maybe the easiest part, but no, it's not the easiest part. <laughs> um, it's, it's the smartest part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, um, so if you can give an example of uh, money in, money out in the hotel industry, like how the cycle works, and, and then the 15% part, is that 15% out of a purchase of something in the hotel that is basically lost in that transaction to buy tokens, and, and then the people that are paying for it need to want tokens and to know about them? Um, actually, you consider that crypto and blockchain is like TCP IP for the internet. People shouldn't get like uh, confronted to that. People pay in fiat. So for example, you go to a hotel, you buy a grilled beef steak in room service for $20. There's $3 that is going to be used to buy back key tokens in the market and redistribute it by the protocol. Um, it's, it's not really, it's, you, you, we, we call it a service fee. <laughs> it's not value lost. Because one of the metrics that we had is that we multiply by three the room service ordering in the hotels with our technology. Our applications actually grow the demand uh, in terms of services. Yeah, because it's actually correctly integrated in the guest experience in the hotel rooms. Um, it's connected to the TV. You could have also a tablet and everything, and it's actually way better in terms of conversion. So the initial tests that we did is that we have a growth of uh, three times in terms of room service ordering. And we multiplied by 1.8 the spa bookings in the hotels. So it's kind of like nice payout. Wait, by running your uh, computational service, your, how, how does that work? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm lost. You, you missed a part. Uh, the operating system actually is an app store. 
to be able to deploy that in the hotels, we had to provide them ser with services that they care about, which is how to better integrate in the guest experience, et cetera, et cetera. So the operating system is actually an Android open source project based OS that can run applications. So there are some very specific hotel hospitality applications that runs on the TV or in a tablet. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. To be able to have a reliable infrastructure that runs 24-7 and not having like some computer that runs a storage node, you need to have a vested interest to have the device running 24-7. And this is the business of the hotels. And it actually works pretty well. How many hotels is on that? <laughs> so right now, uh, we are more counting in terms of rooms. Uh, so we signed 5,300 rooms. And with those 5,300 5, rooms, we have a pipeline of more than 100,000 with the same customers. So we have some pilots, we have some live products, and, and uh, the pipeline with the one that we signed for the 5,000 ones uh, are about 100,000. And just to tell you, so the previous company that acquired my business uh, um, is a core hotel, and uh, we work pretty closely, and they have 628,000 rooms in the world. Actually, the, right now, the initial customers that we have are boutique hotels. They see how many tokens, they could see how many tokens, and they can actually just cash out. So they liquidate the tokens to get uh, fiat. They don't, we don't want them to have to deal with wallets or anything like that. It's like I said, it's in the background. Sorry? Where are they liquidating? Um, in, the, in the back office of... Uh, how does that make you feel as someone who gets paid in tokens? Actually... I like it because it's passive income. It's not something that I have to work for like, to, to have that income. It's something that is automated. So there is the hardware infrastructure lease and there's also additional revenue that is dealt with other third-party services. And there's that transaction fee. It's actually what we're doing. We are fixing the marketplace fee that is value extractive in the protocol. And here, we take value and we share it with the ecosystem. So it always stays with the ecosystem. Thank you. Big round of applause. I think you had my favorite quote of the night. I, I don't see it as a service fee. I see it as making them more money. That, I like that. I love that attitude. All right, Brain Rex is up next. Brain Rex, time to Rex some brains. Hi all, I'm Manti. Uh, basically, I work as a researcher here from uh, for AI, and we have a, uh, we have I don't know, it's just moving. It's on order. It's on order. Oh. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> that, it, yeah, right. Um, Is it still an auto -tune? Go back? However, yeah, maybe just click it. Is that possible? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. What about this? Good enough? More? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, fine. Sorry for all that. Let's just start again. So, hi, I'm Mansi. I work as an AI researcher out here for that of BrainRex. We recently, our AI map came up out uh, as the top 10 best world ranking in that for NLP at Stanford. So. That's something awesome results which you had this week. So going about on brain wrecks, uh, what is happening in the blockchain industry is that we see that there's a lot of free data available and it's not being utilized properly. So what we are looking to do is take up uh, all your customized data inside brain wrecks and it provides machine learning services and that converts uh, that into an anomaly detection. So basically anomaly detection out here can be used for basically fraud analysis, then uh, also like finding out any uh, 
uh, basically taking liquidity kind of uh, decisions during market uh, making or also during kind of like a risk management or even reputation management systems. So going about next, it's not going at the moment. Yes. Which is about the market? Okay, I don't know. Yes. Okay, uh, founders are out in Spain. So basically this is our CTO, Danny, he's a professor at Deep Learning at Madrid. And he's also a contributor at MIT Block Search. And uh, Gonzalo also, like he's uh, one of them who like helped us build the entire protocol of the NLP stack. So uh, yeah, so currently we have like around, we just launched three weeks back in a private, uh, private environment. So we have around, we started off with five users. Now we have around 2,000 plus businesses which are utilizing this platform. So uh, on our uh, private uh, beta, we have around like Circle, Santander, and IBM, and all these companies which are using. We also have a research-oriented universities like that of Imperial College of London, and all are utilizing this platform. Uh, basically, a customer acquisition strategy starts off with that of a free tire of like 20k requests per month. Uh, what we are doing is like providing our data as a unit for as a request over to them. And we also have uh, research partnerships with that of uh, the Imperial College of London, LSC, and UCL. So what, they, what are the types of like, basically it's open to all the professors out there because we want more and more developers to be using this platform and coming up with their own customized systems utilizing our AI models and stuff. And retail partnerships is basically also having a retail partnership with Libra Camp. Uh, so we are with, uh, as a part of a business oriented system with that of Libra Camp and also with IBM, uh, where we are like a financial partner with that of IBM for their sales. So we kind of like go towards all the financial uh, customers or consumers who would be using this data. Um, so basically there are a lot of cool features out here. So uh, like that it can be used for customizing anomalies for that of traders, for blockchain devs, for sentiment analysis and stuff. And also uh, like it, e as it is customized more towards the crypto side, it can utilize like keywords like that of like hard forks or Vitalik or something like that. And it supports uh, iOS and Android and there are around like 20 client SDKs and um, more than like 100 data integrations which are possible. And as you're utilizing BrainRex, the AI and the machine learning is run within the system, so you basically don't need any PhD team or something. You just need like traders or some developers who can just utilize these APIs and proceed ahead. Uh, currently, uh, what we are providing is like a 20K uh, requests. These are based on that of some uh, units. So it's like the entire, uh, like around 100K, uh, 100, Sorry, a thousand transactions are within uh, 20k requests. Uh, uh, the thousand transaction translate to one unit in that of a 20k request. So that's basically what we're trying to give it as a free uh, uh, part for that of all uh, the developers out here to increase our subscription base. Pro after that, we're looking at startups. So, so we're looking at five million requests out there. So we're trying to charge like $200 a month and enterprise is like 800 plus. So that's for 100 million requests. Uh, so our secret sauce is basically consisting of tons of flood of machine learning and research over that. So, and like, yeah, so this is our uh, private um, access for that of the private net which are out here. We'll be launching a public net uh, very shortly in the next like one or two weeks out here in New York and uh, California when the founders will be here. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you, BrainRex. It is not easy to do a presentation when your PowerPoint is messing up. Question. Yeah, um, when you work with your clients and you're utilizing um, their data or you're working together to process their business logic um, at the NLP layer, who owns the IP? Do you own the IP or does your customer own the IP? The customer owns the IP. Okay, so you're just providing the, the algo and the capability of yes, processing actually, the data. They kind of give you requests and like uh, when they give you the request, the customers give you the request from all the data which they uh, give it. 
and then based on that you kind of like perform the algorithm and that gives you the animal you owe the data. So how do you scale the revenue model without adding more and more engineers to build these custom requests? Uh, actually, the data is like already being uh, like utilized by, it's already cleaned off in the first layer itself. So in that, so whatever enters inside the system is just the requisite data which is needed for that to be MLP and all that. So it's like mostly what would come through that, suppose you have wallets, you'd have all the transaction information, you'd have uh, the, uh, the, what do you say, the transactions and all that information and the timestamps and all that. So that basically go through the system and then you'll get an output based on that. And it can also be taken over like huge exchanges and all that. So, uh, you know, blockchains will be the greatest data sets we'll ever seen. And this is a, a massive opportunity to, to productize these data sets. Are, are you, um, just by, uh, uh, aside from just giving the raw data, are you looking to productize certain components so people could API to that versus, yes. you know, just uh, crunching their own data? we have like three or four components right now. Uh, basically, all uh, three or four components, basically, which should detect the anomalies and all that, which is used by some hedge fund and also some wallets, which are using uh, the uh, what, what the fraud detection mechanism. And also, there's some uh, one of the exchanges, like they're right now testing it, it's a big exchange. They're right now just testing it. So what they're using it for that of fraud, uh, the same for fraud mitigation. So. That's what they're using it for. So what, there are different types of algorithms within it. It's like a basket of algorithms. We have four or five right now. So going forward, we'll be increasing that. And yes, that could be added as one of the subscription. But as of now, we are like looking to make it more so, so that more developers can come onto the platform and like they can also utilize this system and all these data and like provide a overall um, like a overall like data platform as an AI platform, so it can be even more customized and better. Now. So the primary use case you're talking about is doing forensic analytics using anomaly detection, but how would a developer want to utilize anomaly detection with your data set? I'm not understanding the target market there. Um, okay, uh, what happens is that like you basically have a data sets with that of like majority of the blockchain. So what uh, blockchain has is basically transaction based data. So it's like we are uh, taking out eight, uh, I think eight or nine uh, transaction based data from that like uh, we have uh, BTC, Bcash, we have in Monero and all that, like around eight chains. And we also have what social media feeds which are coming from that of Twitter, uh, Facebook, and uh, I think Reddit. Yeah, we have even Reddit in. So all of these media, uh, all of these things are coming in. So what is happening is that we are trying to take a complete feed analysis. So based on what you need, what is happening is like, suppose I say I want Bitcoin and I want say uh, early data say for the next thousand, uh, so one unit of a payload would be equal to a thousand, day, thousand kind of like intervals of that data. So I'm talking about thousand hours of that data. So it's like for 20K of that, we are giving it off free. And after that, we'd be like charging. So that's what is the business idea. So what you're trying to say is that like, okay, these are the transactions. But what's the, what's the analysis I'm doing? What am uh, I, what's the anomaly analysis? I understand the forensic analytics use case, but how is the developer using the developer uses our algorithm. Uh, okay. Also, he can use his own customized algorithm if he thinks it is, it is much better than what it is. So there are benchmarks. So we uh, just now like got through like Stanford's uh, algorithm that like ranked more, more than that of top 10. Like they're like eight or nine. So um, bugs, it can, like if I have a new uh, blockchain, you, I would use it uh, to detect bugs in my testnet, for example, is that a good use case? And uh, have you tried it also with um, uh, trading? Uh, yeah, it's been tried with that of uh, Libra as well as other like uh, Bitcoin, I don't know, Bitcoin.com, you know, they are actually experimenting on it right now. Even, uh, yes, for detecting bugs also, and also to detect like, uh, what for basically uh, anomaly for detecting bugs and also system analysis is all can be used. If I have a new blockchain, I want to have a test net and see that. Yes, it can be done. Okay. And now the yeah. trading? Yes. It's basically what happens in al it? it's it Yes, yes, yes. Because algo, algo trading, okay. 
or okay what happens is that like when you do market making at that point of time uh, like if in case something happens like a sudden change or some anomaly change or something like that happens then the algorithm immediately detects and tells you so then accordingly you can take a decision and change the strategy so it's worth it Thank you, Brain Rex. And our final anomaly of the night is Cross Angle. Cross Angle, come up. You are the last living contestant. Uh, hi, uh, I'm James. I'm coming from South Korea. Uh, just before I begin my presentation, I'll just give a quick description of what I have been doing before I started this company. So. I was managing uh, a venture capital and a family office fund, one of the largest family office funds in South Korea. Uh, when it comes to blockchain, I was engaged in acquiring exchanges around the world. So I was dealt on dealing, acquiring Corbit, which was Korea's first crypto exchange, uh, Bitstamp last year. That was my last deal before I left. And always also was hunting for other exchanges around Africa, Mongol, Japan, Russia, uh, a little bit into US as well. Uh, but market saturated pretty fast, and I managed uh, around the 90 million USD worth of crypto asset, mostly investing only into uh, large cap tokens. The um, reason I gave you this brief description is that's why I started this business, because uh, when I was trying to rebalance the fund, uh, when I was managing in, in, the, in the shoe of a conglomerate or large corporate in Asia, uh, there were no information I could make any decisions upon. So. Usually there are corp um, course of actions you have to follow, protocols you have to follow, some data set you have to, uh, to have in order to make decisions. And I've been to many seminars, conferences, but data was, were missing. So that's how I started this business. So uh, Cross Angle is our company name, Sangle is our platform name, and it's a crypto finance project disclosure platform. So, um, so I'll start with what we're trying to solve. So if you look into the traditional uh, finance market, stock market, startup, there's a startup. You take private company, you take private investment. It IPOs and they move on to the public trading market, secondary trading market, which in that phase you need a public information platform. In US, that's uh, SCC filing uh, system, which is called Edgar, and there's equivalent systems around the world, Edinet in Japan, Dart in Korea. But however, if you look into the structural of the crypto market, after the crypto assets were listed in exchanges, they went public, and usually the projects do not know who their investors are. However, information still remained private, which made a information asymmetry structurally, which made it a very smart move to only deal with speculative trading, because if you know the information first, you don't have to do heavy analysis in order to come out with which ones you're gonna invest first. So uh, our service decided to focus more on the post-issuance market. Everybody was talking, I'm going to issue this asset, I'm going to um, like list, list these kind of tokens into the exchange, but we were looking into, you need more actual services to, in order to make it public into the market. In order to penetrate to the mass adoption, you need a very bold service, which makes most of the public understand what you're trying to do with, it, with those projects or tokens. So this is how we dealt with the problems and how we try to solve these issues. So uh, like I mentioned before, there's SEC, which deals with the public information, and there's a lot of exchanges who are actually dealing with public trading. Crypto exchanges around the world, there are many around the world, and we try to be the Edgar platform for the crypto assets, whatever that can be financed through, through crypto that has on-chain information. So uh, why we call it uh, Edgar? Because if you're trying to make an institutional level of decision when you're investing, uh, you need complete scope. Uh, you need a standard of what kind of information you need. And you have to have it. Um, either you have 40%, 80%, it's the same. Either you have 100% of all the information that you need, or it's close to nothing. And real time, you have to know what's happening into the project. After you list it, most of the exchanges lose control of what's happening. They, don't, they can't tell their investors what's happening into the assets they're dealing with, which haven't already listed in trading. And if you're going to deal with a disclosure market of information, you have to have trust and neutral, neutrality and objectiveness in the platform. 
Okay, so we looked into the traditional financial um, standards to begin with, um, like Edgar and a lot of SMP uh, structures. And, yeah, I'll just go in next. and uh, our data set includes a lot of on-chain data, but also off-chain data, which a lot of market were missing at the stage. That an off-chain information includes corporate data and financial information, which are disclosed directly from the teams. Our accomplishments, uh, we have been connecting around 30 global exchanges around the world. We are working with the listing teams directly, and li how it works is listing teams approach us when they get a uh, listing request. We uh, compile the information, we get back to them, and it's not just a one-time thing that we do. We constantly follow up with projects in order to provide what's happening into the world. So, uh, maybe uh, just next slide. So these are some of the assets uh, and services that we provide. We have a platform already live and running, and there's some due diligence reports that can be uh, produced by institutional investors right away. So uh, to conclude, um, we run this public disclosure platform, but it's neutral and we don't take fees from that. Our business model is to provide some efficient service kits that you can use for some of the locked-in services that we will be taking revenue will start from um, earliest by next month. Uh, it's already uh, okay. end of November, early December. So we'll be providing API service to our partner exchanges and that, those information of token updates will be curated on right next to the trading information that only have charts and bid and ask and trading volumes. And others uh, that we haven't planned after that, we will provide some additional toolkits and services for people to easily manage the information. So to conclude, um, there's no discrepancy in information itself just because you're paying. You only have the different service of efficiently managing services and that's pretty much it. Thank you. All right, step right up here. Judges, questions? Um, which exchanges are you currently partnered with? How are you working with them today? And then what revenue do you expect to get from working with them over the next six months to 12 months? Uh, we have around 30 exchanges and in Korea we have pretty much all the exchange other than Upbeat are working with us and sign? yes, we sign contracts. And uh, in Japan there's 20 exchanges which are controlled by FSA which is like SEC. And around 20, I believe 10 of them have been ordered to correct their business because of their false or some uncontrolled security. So we have uh, onboarded around seven exchanges from Japan, so we are taking majority as well. We onboarded some Indonesia, Vietnam uh, exchanges. We recently onboarded Bitstamp uh, from Europe, and we're working with um, uh, it's Chinese exchanges as well. Um, their branch offices from OK, uh, OKX and Huobi as well. And we're discussing with two uh, major exchanges in US, also in Brazil and Africa at this stage. And how are you working with them? Uh, so uh, we don't share any monetary payment at this stage because we want to test out what kind of criteria they would need. And we wanted to standardize how they use information from the project. So we have um, exchange of business values. So as a disclosure platform, you need as many projects to disclose information on our platform. So how we work with this, exchanges who are approaching those exchanges for any listing, they will redirect the projects to disclose information on the platform. And then in return, we aggregate the information uh, on off-chain information and we run those on mainnet as ourselves in order to get on-chain information and we integrate the information and provide it to the exchanges. So, the revenue will come afterwards as we are discussing with some of the early partners, uh, partner exchanges uh, from Korea, uh, Japan, and Singapore, and uh, they will be using our API services from that. We haven't gone into specific figures of numbers because uh, we're trying to figure out the right pricing model for that because um, they have different number of tokens and different number of usage, so um, we're still figuring out for now, yes. Oh, uh, well, crypto assets started as a transnational asset, um, but business, you still have to, it's a, still most of the teams are startups. They have different things to focus on. They're building their business technology. 
However, most of the teams were heavily dealing with um, the IR activity and marketing um, because they had to deal with global market right away. And I think um, because of that, most of the teams were suffering not being able to focus what they have to. So we centralized the information inflow. So projects will be disclosing on our platform according to the standard that we have arranged with our partner exchanges. And once they disclose information on our website, it goes public, uh, agree, uh, agreed by the projects, and it will be inquired by our listing teams of all our partner exchanges and funds and media partners right away. Is there a case study you can point to where sharing more information with an early stage crypto project worked out better for the project uh, versus the other, which maybe there's some that didn't share, but it actually had no meaningful impact? Oh, we didn't have time to do a test run on the result, but to somewhat just give you some related answers to that, um, project team uh, who are suffering from IR activity, managing hundreds of people in different languages and Telegram chats, uh, they were able to just share, share all the new disclosure on our platform first. So they didn't have to suffer from FUDs, they just told their clients or investors to check whatever information here. So if you're suspicious about something, this is what we disclose, so you can check here. We try to become that source of information which helps project teams uh, work much more efficiently in IR activities. Another thing is they needed to approach exchanges one by one. And we looking into all those partner exchanges that have listing criteria, it's all different and depth are also different. They had to go one by one um, to all exchanges in order to go to other markets. They had to pay a lot. So we got rid of that uh, we just by centralizing the information aggregation and the exchanges didn't have to deal with all the legal accusation, accusation of them trying to do something else that they received $1 million or not. And it, the process become also very faster. So yes. Last question. Um, how do you deal with the challenges? So in most jurisdictions, being a data provider or a research provider mm -hmm. or publicly listed assets is a regulated activity that requires licensing. How do you deal with the, and obviously it varies widely, how do you deal with that component? And then from an independence perspective, um, mm -hmm. how do you sort of create a position of independence? Because obviously you have a financial incentive mm -hmm. as well. How do you preserve your independence even though you're getting paid to provide research? Oh, uh, to answer your second question first, um, we don't get paid from the project teams or we don't get paid from the exchanges just because of information. So it's public disclosure, so anyone here you can access to our website right away and you'll be able to see all the information. The ones who pay, who will be using our API service or some of our toolkits, they have, will be able to manage much more easily. So for exchanges, they can take a look at all the information on our website. But if they want to pull all the data through API to create on their websites to increase trading volume by increasing, uh, providing more materials to, for investors, on then that's how we get paid. So I th and also all the information uh, we leave change so logs. You're proposing that you're going to become a ratings agency of some sort. Uh, not not sure. We don't try to evaluate any other project. We just compile and try to make sure uh, decision makers can have enough information to make decisions. So that's as far Very as we. Very quick question, and then you get hey, you take his car, guys. <laughs> to protect the uh, investors, mm -hmm. uh, which is important, but uh, you don't have uh, enforcement, right? The mm -hmm. government has guns and mm -hmm. stuff. So how, uh, yeah. how do you enforce, you know, a project told you something and then they lied? And oh, okay. Do uh, you have a role in that? Yeah, uh, so we looked into how the traditional finance market is working. You can't do pre-due diligence on every information because you have to go count how many headcounts there are. So we have incentives and penalty model. I think it works for the international market. So if it goes beyond the boundary of a specific country, um, if you look into S&P for existence, Apple does not have to provide information to S&P. They don't have any duty to do so. But if they don't, uh, their credit rate might go down. So they have more incentive to participate providing information. So this is the basic rule of in providing incentives and penalties. And incentives are some of the parts that I mentioned. If they disclose information, their information will be distributed through our partner exchanges and media, so their, their recognition and their delivery to investors' uh, coverage will increase. The penalty part is we are discussing with the, uh, all these partner exchanges from different jurisdictions 
uh, making a listing criteria and a delisting criteria based on the disclosing topics they have because they didn't have any until yet. And they, it's crypto, uh, it's an international product. So one company uh, based exchange could not make that decision. They need to lie on their peer exchanges around the world and we're trying to play that role to mitigate that role in between. Okay, so judges, thank you, Cross Angle. Judges, we need you all to stand up and take a quick picture. All the people who just presented the five projects, come take a quick picture. We're gonna total up the points that each team got, and we will present the winner in three minutes, so don't leave yet. And we have a couple announcements. I hope you guys totaled uh, on your sheets, right? We are going to start with number three which is Xangol. Please Ross come on Angle. up. Yes. Number three. Xangol, also In known as Cross Angle. Battle. Congratulations. You are getting a unicorn pinata. Yeah. Congratulations on surviving Battlefield. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, I was hoping to get the pinata, and I thought it would be the first prize but happy to get it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and Jane had another question for you, so don't leave before you talk to all the judges. They had a lot of questions for you. All right, number two is probably our, our most candy-related project. You all know what it is. Nougat is number two. <laughs> Nicely done, open source nougat. Well, first I want to thank Satoshi. All right, that's it. Yeah. All right, that's it. Wait, uh, who is he? It's not you? <laughs> no. Hey, thank, thank you. you, thank you. All right, congratulations. It is actually filled with Halloween candy, and you may share it with the audience here. All right, our number one blockchain battlefield champion of the world. The one and only undisputed Snowball! You are the Epicenter Blockchain Battlefield winner! Congratulations! You are now the champion of Fortnite as well as the Blockchain Battlefield.